While all the political stuff was happening on Earth, space was having its own issues. In the beginning, the biggest problem with outer space was reaching it. As cool as rockets looked, they were costly to build and limiting in how much you could send to space at any one time. Thankfully, a private research consortium had found a workaround. They had perfected the material science necessary to create a strong and flexible cable capable of linking Earth to something in low orbit, the first and most necessary step in the creation of a space elevator. And when they did, they promptly open sourced the technology, allowing every nation on Earth the chance to build these massive space elevators and help humanity expand to the wider solar system. And soon enough, construction began on a chain of orbital elevators all along the planet's equator. Now that everything was easy once humanity had the tech, the construction of these elevators required vast resources and infrastructure on the ground, which meant that many equatorial countries found themselves under the attention of much bigger nations, forcing many to make deals that resulted in a massive influx of employees for orbital construction companies and supporting industries, an influx known as the Equatorial Surge. Some of these deals were relatively beneficial for both sides, such as when Ecuador became a client state of Pan-Oceana and gained all the benefits of being part of that growing power. Others not so much, leading to things like the road wars in Africa. Corporations had competed with each other to construct the communication trade lines for the orbital elevator and enlisted and armed the rival tribes of villages that got in their way. These mercenaries became known as the Mkuku, which is spear in Swahili named for their habit of impaling their victims on spears. Of course, as the elevator neared completion, these Mkuku were no longer useful and were quickly declared war criminals and shoved off to the Corregidor. Ah, sorry, getting ahead of myself there. Let me backtrack a bit. I should probably explain what the Corregidor was. Back in your day, there were dangerous narco gangs in the Americas that fought with each other relentlessly over the drug trade leading to a ton of violence that was barely handled by the country's police forces or sometimes even the military. Well, during one of these gang wars, a school bus was caught in the crossfire, a tragedy that might have been eventually forgotten like so many others if that school bus hadn't been from an international school carrying the children of the political and social elite of the Americas. And well, with so many powerful politicians and CEOs losing their children, or personally knowing someone who had, no amount of bribery or backroom dealing would prevent a substantial response. A conglomerate of South American nations worked together to create the Corregidor, a high security prison in low earth orbit where the most dangerous criminals of the continent and eventually the world would be sentenced to what was called death in life, where inmates were held in states of induced sleep, kept alive through intravenous nutrition, and periodically awakened in order to be psychologically afflicted by their plight. The prison remained fully in operation until the stock market crunch a few years later and funding started to dwindle. And when Chile and Brazil joined Pan-Oceana and withdrew from the project, the Corregidor became starved for resources and conditions worsened significantly as the company in charge started various cost-cutting measures. The heads of the prison debated numerous ideas to gain revenue until eventually settling on what was called the Lazaretto Expansion a pardon program where inmates were given the chance to earn their freedom by expanding the station with new habitats and hydroponic modules, essentially aiming to make the Corregidor self-sufficient. And once it was done, various nations moved up a significant amount of the surplus population they had gained during the equilateral surge, as well as a large number of rebel guerrillas, veterans of tribal wars, headhunters, political dissidents, and various other peoples those nations wanted to forget existed. And once that was done, the Corregidor was then privatized, which was business and political speak for cutting them loose and leaving them to fend for themselves. Basic survival was an issue for a while, and I'm sure there was some bloody power struggles as those up there tried to figure out who was in charge. But eventually the situation stabilized, especially when the Corregidorans were able to carve out a niche in the booming space economy by trading manpower which they had plenty of, for supplies and spare parts. Eventually, they became known as the best zero-g workers across human space, traveling around in their former prison, now giant spaceship, to wherever they can lend their services. And there was plenty of work to be had as the finished space elevators allowed the rapid expansion of humanity across the solar system. Places such as the lunar colonies, Eugen's Mars bases, and mining operations in the asteroid belts, getting a huge surplus of people and supplies. But humanity would not remain locked in their solar system. 
A discovery known as the Ring Storm would allow them to reach far beyond our star. At some point, observatories across the solar system had begun to notice that parts of the rings around Saturn seemed to twist and ripple. A strange visual effect that was later learned to be caused by gravity distortions from humanity's first encounter with a wormhole. I won't try to explain the math to you, but in layman's terms, these wormholes are formed from, um, the echoes of natural quantum tunneling effects. Echoes that would eventually be known as Sorel fields. Fields that allow persistent tunnels between two points in space. That technically allows matter to pass through. I say technically because anything that passes through these wormholes tends to turn into a subatomic mush. Eventually, it was discovered that the Sorel fields could be manipulated, giving humans the ability to dampen and smooth out the spatial fluctuations, creating a bubble of stable space that they could push through. The Sorel field manipulator soon allowed humanity to send probes through, and on the other side, humanity got its first up-close glimpses of Delta Bavanis, an alien star orbited by alien worlds. And after some further probing, it was discovered that one of those worlds could support human life, the world was named Dawn, seen as a symbol of the dawning of a new age of humanity. And with the discovery of Dawn came Project Dawn, a joint effort between NASA, the European Space Agency, and the Russian Cosmonautical Agency to establish an extrasolar colony, an effort that sadly ended in tragedy, as during the transit of the Aurora, the second colony ship sent to Delta Bavanis, that the ship's Sorel field manipulators failed causing a rupture that not only killed everyone on board, but caused the entire wormhole to collapse and vanish. The entire human race mourned not only the loss of life, but also what seemed to be the end of extrasolar travel. For although other wormholes were discovered in the system before the tragedy, no one else deemed passage through the wormholes as worth the risk. That was until Pan-Oceana scientists discovered an alternate method of using Sorel field manipulators. They realized that instead of trying to force their way through a wormhole, they could focus the fields near its center and travel through a much more stable, if much harder to navigate, path through. Basically the difference between simply swimming through an ocean and traveling through a natural underwater current. This theory became the basis for the Minotaur motor, a delicate, complex, and extremely expensive piece of technology that calculates extraordinarily precise geometries to travel safely through the wormhole equivalent of a needle's eye. Even nowadays, Minotaur motors are extremely expensive and difficult to make, meaning the only people who can usually afford it are governments, hypercorps, military forces, and the really, really rich. For everyone else, there are circulars. Think of them as kilometers long space buses that allow regular folks to either board them or attach their small ships to them for a reasonable fee. Anyway, with the creation of the Minotaur motor, Pan Oceana launched the Mandela, a manned vessel that went through a recently discovered wormhole and appeared around another star, one that contained a life-bearing world Pan Oceana called Neoterra. And with its discovery, the true space race had begun. You see, Pan Oceana leadership considered colonization the ultimate realization of the destino tecnologico, and Neoterra, as well as another world named Acontecimiento that was discovered years later, ignited a national fervor that affected every strata of their society. The government created incentive-based programs to convince people to travel to these new worlds, and many were quite eager to accept these offers. Some of these people were true patriots, bursting with national pride. Others wanted to simply escape the hellholes that many parts of Earth had become. Whatever their reasons for leaving, their move to the colony significantly lowered the Earth's once soaring unemployment rate which combined with the raw wealth of the two virgin worlds flowing back to the planet, resulted in a massive economic stimulus. Eventually, Pan Oceana even moved their seat of government off-world to Neoterra, establishing their power base in the new capital city of San Pietro. With the success of Pan Oceana, Yu Jin quickly realized that they were risking being left behind. They had originally considered deep space investment a fad, a black hole of federal budgets that was capable of destabilizing economies, a viewpoint reinforced by the disaster of Project Dawn. They had instead chosen to invest heavily in the inner system, particularly Mars, and had planned to eventually push out to the outer system and dominate trans-plutonium mining, hoping to create a domineering presence in the solar system. By the time they had realized that extrasolar colonies was the future, Pan Oceana was at least a decade ahead of them in space development. That said, unlike Pan Oceana, Yu Jin had a centralized economy that could be turned on a dime. Research funds were swiftly redistributed, 
and entire universities were repurposed and made to work in concert with private industry. This shift in focus paid off when Eugene discovered a pair of binary planets orbiting each other in the hybrid zone of their star. In a blaze of propaganda, these worlds were named Shen Tang and Yu Tang, and all of Yu Jin celebrated, proclaiming that the gap between these two hyperpowers had been closed. In the wake of the Concilium Convention, O12 launched Project Odyssea, with the goal of finding a world to establish their headquarters. This was thought of as a way to isolate themselves from the corruptive legacies of Earth and embrace the new galactic legacy of humanity. Eventually, a new world was discovered that they called Concilium Prima. Sadly, O12 lacked the resources necessary to develop a full-scale colony, and all the hyperpowers competed for a toehold, further delaying the colonization. It wasn't until Hak Islam, another hyperpower discussed later, withdrew, in exchange for diplomatic concessions, that the tripartite colonization accords were signed. A bit of legislation that would ensure Panoceana and Eugen interests were equally represented in the development of the planet under O12 control. And once the world was developed enough, O12's central bureaucracy was moved to Neoterra. And with its move, a new galactic calendar was created, with day one being the day when O12 officially arrived on the world and formally announced the new galactic age of humanity, a humanity that had changed politically, economically, and as I'll explain, religiously. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the second video on how the universe of infinity came to be. If you like it, please like, subscribe, comment, press the little bell so you know whenever I post, etc. So that the YouTube guys know I exist and hopefully more people can know about my content and know more about the infinity universe. If you really like it and you have the cash on the side, please consider giving a little money my way to my Patreon account or even my Kofi account. The extra money gives you a chance to work on these stories I love. Anyway, thank you for listening slash watching and uh, see you next time.